Hey, how's it going? Not too bad here. How's it going there? I'm not bad. I'm ready to sacrifice. Yeah, you look like you're sitting in the uh, the place of sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice background. In, in yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, you, you got the benefit. You can, I, I guess I could do that too. I could sit wherever I want and change my background, but um, <laughs> you never know where you're going to find uh, Pastor Mapis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always in an undisclosed uh, location on Monday. That's always my deep dive study day. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm an all, I'm always everywhere and it uh, sometimes in one place, sometimes in multiple places, just depends. Yeah. Well, I've, I have been known to tell the, your secret uh, when people ask me, <laughs> where is he actually at? Cause he's got a different background and uh, I was talking to somebody last week and they're, they're probably watching now. Mm -hmm. So they'll appreciate this. They, they, they suggested that maybe you should, you could go to the Holy land uh, one of these times, you know, you could go literally <laughs> yeah, anywhere around the world. So <laughs> Um, that'd have been great if I could have got right in front of the temple and talk about sacrifices, which we're going to be talking about today. Wouldn't that have been neat yeah, to do? Get some bloody carcasses behind you. That would have been um, <laughs> yeah. eye-catching. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to talk today about the, the bloody sacrifices. We're going to talk about uh, what the Bible says about sacrifice, and uh, particularly looking at the Old Testament sacrificial system, which was the uh, the Chief, highest component, one of the most prominent components, if not the most prominent component of Old Testament worship was the sacrifices that God had commanded them to do. And so we're going to talk, you know, 20,000 foot view of what those are. And um, we're not going to get into the nitty gritties of, you know, that's the book of Leviticus. You can go through and see uh, which was commanded for which sins and which situations and, and all that. But um, we're going to kind of just get a basic concept of what that sacrificial system was about, right? Yep. That, yeah, that's uh, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> that's yeah. good. That's what, that's what that's I'm our, planning on. That, hey, that's our plan. Hey, let's run with it. Yeah. So so where, where do you want to start? Do you want to? Um... Well, I think you have to start again. You always like with everything in the Bible. It, uh, why do we do what we do? Well, it all begins. It goes back to Genesis chapter three. Well, what happened there? We all know that. We had the fall of mankind as as uh, uh, as Adam and Eve actually uh, desired to have God's omniscience himself or his omniscience and knowing good and evil. Yeah. And they bought the lie of Satan. Well, there was consequences of that. And and now God had to which he had a what's one of the beautiful things is he had a plan from the foundations of the world before the foundation of the world, a plan of redemption in place. Because right. in his omniscience, he also saw what was going to take place. Yeah, boy, you and, just made me think yeah. about that Revelation verse where it says the lamb that was slain from before the foundations of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, that's Exactly. That's, I didn't even consider that as I was uh, preparing for today. But yeah, that's the, the timelessness of God's sacrifice for us. That outside of creation, even before the fall into sin, God had known what Christ would be for us. And so that's. We're kind of giving away the uh, <laughs> the best part of of the Old Testament sacrificial system with that uh, as my fault, but um, yeah, he had well, a plan. You know, there, plan. There's, there's, yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. We can be uh, deductive in our method and let them know up front where we're going to take them instead of yeah. keeping it as an inductive surprise. But anyway, um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it goes it, it goes back to that time in Genesis chapter three, and so now a toma a. A way now that God has to bring his fallen creation back into relationship with himself, back into the garden, so to speak, to right. be access to the tree of life, uh, where mortality and, and, and fellowship where they can have with God forever. And you see that right away. I, and I personally, I think it's the way I take it. And there in Genesis chapter 3, verses 21, I think I have that verse right, where you have, we first have the attempt of Adam and Eve trying to clothe themselves. You know, and their guilt and shame. God finds them. He knows where they're at. Hey, where you're at? Where are you? He knows where they're at. Yeah. Calling them out to repentance and, and the situation now they're in. And now he, God now acts in their behalf. He closes them. He closes them. He closes them with animal skins. And with that, you have to assume that they're shedding of blood with them. With that clothing. They, they right. cover their guilt and shame. And now in his not only in his providential care to clothe them properly, but also to spiritually clothe them. And then you now you see that carried out in the Genesis chapter four, 
where you have the sacrifices of of of, of Cain and Abel. Yeah. You know, both were given in faith. Well, Abel's was given in faith. Cain's wasn't. Both were sacrifices uh, in a sense. But you see, it's interesting with Abel's. He's given his in faith, but it's also, he, it's the first fruit of his flock. Mm -hmm. Again, you see this shedding of blood taking place with Abel's sacrifice. And yeah. then, of course, as things developed, as the people were delivered out of the land of Egypt, out of the hand of Pharaoh, symbolizing, you know, taking his people out of really the kingdom of Satan and right. moving back to himself into the promised land. He now institutes a system of sacrifices in the book of Exodus. And it's really fleshed out in the in the book of Leviticus. And yep. some of those things, the sacrifices that, that came about with that was you have burnt offerings and grain offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, and trespass offerings. With the exception of grain offerings, all those offerings required a blood sacrifice with all those offerings, which showed to people of God then that that their sins were forgiven in this blood sacrifice and they were and they were restored or brought into a relationship with them. That's kind of what the, the grain offering assured them, which the one that didn't require a blood sacrifice. It was a it was a it was a sacrifice or an offering of assurance that God was letting as God accepted that offering. Right. That showed that now we are back and restored into a fellowship with each other. Yep. And then you would see that how that was carried out through God's people throughout the centuries. And yes. of course, once they got in the promised land, these sacrifices got bastardized in some ways with with not in some ways, really, but really in a, in a worse way by taking on the practices of their pagan neighbors. Yeah. Yep. Around. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting uh, thing. There, there's a there's a lot we can unpack with all this. But I, I want to point out the. Uh, that you you kind of um, gave us a great overview of of broad strokes of the Old Testament sacrifices, but but that first sacrifice um, and and I think you even mentioned before we went on our our recording here that um, you know people debate about whether it's mentioning it as a sacrifice because it's it's so different than the rest, but but that that clothing of Adam and Eve with the animal skin. Um, commonly assumed that that's the first death of the world uh, in the world is, yeah. is that God slaughtered an animal um, skinned it to cover Adam and Eve. And, um, and I, I love that picture because it shows how inadequate our ability to, to take care of our filth, our ick, our, our uncleanness, um, our unholiness is in, in our shame. We, we can't, we can't make it go away. We can, we can, we can, start to think we've taken care of things and start to placate ourselves into thinking everything's okay because we we distract ourselves to death these days and i i there's i think there's just so many fig leaf ways we try to cover up the things that are wrong both in our lives and in the world um but but the one sacrifice we need that is represented by god's sacrifice there for them that he covers their sin he covers their shame he clothes them and, and gives them what they need um so that they can um uh, continue and that's that's exactly what jesus is for us and so it's for me i i love that that picture that glimpse it, it preaches so well uh, on so many things that we attempt to do to save ourselves in this world but god is the one who saves us um so yeah then uh cain and abel that's a great story as well but um the I, the other one i kind of wanted to dig a little bit deeper on just to kind of picture it is the uh the passover lamb that you, you kind of yeah um, right yeah, I kind of skipped over that. Over, you, no, you, you mentioned the Exodus, but that's a huge part of the Exodus um, yeah. event, that they were called to right. sacrifice the Passover lamb and then to spread its blood on the doorposts. And and who did it point to other than I got Jesus in the frame today because we're talking about the sacrifice. Um, but but he's he's spread not over a, a door frame, but his blood is spread on the cross and shed on the cross. And and that it's it's just a beautiful connection of of God delivering us from the Egypt of sin that we're all born into, into the, through the Red Sea waters of baptism, if you will, into the uh, wilderness of this world until we're taken to the promised land. And it's that, that blood uh, sacrifice that, that continued. And so that um, I think was the first regularly yeah. ordered sacrifice that God can, uh, he didn't command them to do it every year right away. But I think once they got into the wilderness, um, right maybe before the first anniversary of the Passover, um, but that was the first instituted. And then um, they had the daily sacrifices instituted. I, 
Um, last month, I preached on um, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the uh, John 1 verse 29 passage we had in our Epiphany 2 uh, lectionary. And I, I just, just give you a little taste of that. Uh, twice a day, a lamb would be sacrificed for Israel. Those were the daily lamb offerings that were offered. So 730 lambs a year. Just think about that. That's just for the, mm. the daily lamb offerings. But then I um, found this in my, my study that week. Uh, uh, when Solomon's temple was dedicated, the Bible tells us that within a two-week period, over 120,000 sheep were sacrificed within two weeks. Um, so just think about how much sacrifice went on in the Old Testament and um, what it pointed to, what it actually provided. I I was reading um, Horace Hummel, who's a, a now sainted uh, with the Lord um, a teacher in the church. That he he talked about how the um, um, what did he talk about? What was I saying? <laughs> <laughs> I just lost my train of thought when I well how all those sacrifices pointed to the one I believe it's yeah oh yeah they pointed to the one but he he calls them he actually says that these uh um um externally Israel's sacrifices have much in common with sacrifices all over the world but functional functionally they are sacraments God actually attached a promise with these sacrifices that he was doing and and so that's what our sacraments are is God's attached a promise to these earthly right. elements to deliver something to us. So um, again, getting back to where we started, this was the worship life of the Old Testament. This is how God promised to be acting for His people. And it's interesting because you, you know, yeah, I think there's three. You know, you have the, I mentioned the smaller and those other sacrifices that were done on a daily basis, but you mentioned, you know, you had to mention the big one, you know, with uh, uh, with Genesis three twenty one, and you have there the the Passover sacrifice, but also you had the big one in Leviticus and Leviticus sixteen. We have the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur. Have a bull, Yom Kippur. When you have a so when you'd have the, the bull and you'd have a goat, uh, you actually had to bring two goats. One would be sacrificed. Well, the, the bull and the goat would be sacrificed, and then the priest would lay his hand on the other goat, where he would announce the sins of of the people of Israel. All their iniquities would be placed upon that goat and then be set away, which we you mentioned that word earlier, expi expiation taken away from us through yeah. propitiation, that sense of, of of that blood sacrifice, turning away God's wrath upon his people, the goat now taking away that sins from the people as well. And really that day of atonement was the right. one that really, and I, I would argue too with the Passover, it was the one that made all the other sacrifice, the validity of the sacrifices made them valid because mm -hmm. then that day of atonement pointed to that one who would be Christ, who would make that day of atonement for not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Yeah, right. Yeah, definitely. It's a, a beautiful, beautiful system that was set up there. There was a, a threefold um, uh, practice that um, that threefold function that these provided and within the sacramental uh, sac sacrificial system. Um, the um, the first was the idea of a sacrifice as being an opportunity to thank God for the blessings that you have. And so I think that's one that we kind of gloss, at least in my mind, I, I gloss over when talking about this Old Testament um, sacrificial system. But um, I was reading a little bit of John Kleinig, too, and he, he was pointing out that not everybody would regularly bring a lamb it wasn't like sometimes you think about well they're going up for passover they're all going to bring their own lamb it wasn't necessarily that kind of system but every everybody would do uh he mentioned that everybody would do a grain offering regularly the cereal offering if you will and um so that was something but it, it was a sacrifice uh an acknowledgement that what you have comes from god and and so that's that i think is a great way to latch on to that connection we have in the Old Testament sacrificial system to our uh, modern day collection of the offerings. We're, we're sacrificing right. a part of our income, a part of our, our means, and, and you can go beyond the financial into the time and talents, treasures, you know, that we, we often talk about with stewardship, that we, we are giving back to God because he's first given to us, and we're acknowledging that. So that first one, that Thanksgiving act, the second one is that the sacrifices offered an opportunity of communion with God, of being with God and fellowship with God. And so the first one, uh, Thanksgiving function. Uh, second one is that it's a community function or a fellowship function with God. 
And then that third one is the one that we've been talking about and, and that I most often associate with the Old Testament sacrificial system. The point so strongly to Christ is that it's uh, for the forgiveness of sins, that, that that payment for sin, that covering of sin. And, and so that keeping those uses in mind, that's that's what the Israelites understood they were doing. That's what scripture gives us that they were doing. But there, there's a fourth use of sacrifices in the Old Testament times that was not um, associated with these. And, and uh, that was the pagan, one of the pagan uses of uh, sacrifices was that they thought they were giving food to their gods so that their God could continue to exist because their God needed their food. Hmm. And it's important to note that God didn't need these sacrifices. They were a gift for his people, which is, I think, a helpful way to um, think about it and, and realize, because well, I'll stop talking after this last thought here and let you say something. But the, uh, well, one of that's the all right. I'm looking for something. Go ahead. <laughs> one of the things that comes to mind is, is that um, it seems like this is a very uh, works based thing that the people of Israel were bringing these things. Right. They were slaughtering the animals. They were burning the animals. And then the priests would eat the animal, the sacrifices. It, it seems like a very person, uh, human oriented, human operated endeavor here but it's really god who's working through this which he's called them to do which is so sacramental for us today where it might seem that because we're consuming the body and blood of jesus we're baptizing our babies and and whoever needs to be baptized in the name of the father son and holy spirit it seems like our action but god's the primary operator and, and i think that's an important thing to realize about the sacrificial system back then this wasn't them giving something to god because god needed it of them they were doing it because God said, this is how you thank me. This is how you acknowledge me. This is how you commune with me. This is how you receive forgiveness from me. And, and so it's God's operating place in these sacrifices. It, you did trigger me on something. You mentioned something about how we, you know, we make, you know, these sacrifices were made, but then at the same time, I think Dr. McConnick mentioned it, and I think he mentioned it. It triggered me anyways at how we are to live our lives as a result of that sacrifice. Yeah. And it's interesting, if you look at the book of Leviticus, after the Day of Atonement, it's, it's talked about in chapter 16. Chapter 17 goes into, I think it's 17 to chapter 27, talks about how the people are to live, from the priest to the people. And mm -hmm. it talks about it has all kinds of things, what not to do, what to do. But you see that same structure is talked about even in Paul's letters, where you have, you know, in Romans, where he talks, he really unpacks the, sacrifice of christ and what all that means for us and by the way therefore we now yeah. go forth and you see that same structure throughout many of the scriptures that sacrifice has been made and now we go forth yeah as forgiven people of god right and we get to be living sacrifices that's what the passage i was trying to find i could not find it for the life of me I, maybe you can <laughs> Come well, your mind, but um, chapter 12 of Romans, um, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, there it is. holy and acceptable yeah. to God, which is your spiritual worship. I, yeah, I, I went in the Lutheran study Bible. This is one of our um, yeah. peek behind the curtain preparatory things in the, the front of uh, the Lutheran study Bible is a topical index. And so I looked at the two little articles they have about sacrifices in here and um, anyways, yeah, so that's that was there. And there's a great um, uh, little article on page 1934 of the Lutheran Study Bible, Living Sacrifices in View of God's Mercy, which doesn't really get it. I, and I don't want to delve into this too much other than just to see that um, we do continue to sacrifice. We, we don't have this sacramental attribute uh, of the sacrifice that we we sacrifice to God and for God and dedicate our lives to God. Um, but because of the, uh, the mercies and, and forgiveness and grace and the new life, the holiness that we receive through Christ's death on the cross, through the proclaimed word, uh, when we receive that, our, our lives do become and are pleasing to God because of Christ being with us and for us. No, exactly. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's a beautiful pattern that's set forth early on in Scripture, even throughout the New Testament. It's a pattern for we as Christians, how we to liberalize is. As we go and receive the body, blood of Christ, 
uh, in the Holy Eucharist on a Sunday morning, having our sins absolved, hearing the yep. word of God proclaimed and taught, and even the instruction that comes from our preaching. You know, people are edified and fed and assured that now they have been restored back to God and are God's people. Now they go forth out to the sanctuary and their vocations and to be those living sacrifices, not only yeah. to God, but also to their neighbor as well. And it's a it's a wonderful motif. If you use your word used earlier is uh, um, of how we are to go forth as Christians. And it's a very it's very simple marching orders, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, it's it's so simple. Nothing, it's nothing, Let's just do it. It's just so simple. Right. Exactly. Well, Let's just do this. This thing, sin thing keeps getting in the way, though. So that's why we yeah, need to keep yeah, coming back. But that, like you back. said, that's that's the simplicity of it. Is we we acknowledge our sin and our need of a savior, and that savior is with us. And if we feel like he's not with us, come back. He's there for you, and, and he's ready to go with you again. Well, I I preached on the uh, the fifth and sixth and third commandments in that text in the Matthew text uh, last. This oh, you covered a lot then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I covered a lot of material. It was kind of a lengthy sermon, but anyway. It, uh, I covered all three of those, and but I reminded the people that that our righteousness doesn't come from the obedience to the law, but it's the obedience that's found in Jesus Christ and his keeping of the law. So therefore, we can go forth and uphold God's law, just as Paul talks about in Romans 6. Should we keep on saying that grace may abound? No, we uphold the law yep. as forgiven children walking in God's grace. We can now keep God's law and uphold God's law while we fail miserably at it all the time and constantly need that daily repentance uh, and receiving that forgiveness. And uh, but to that, I mean, that, that's uh, with that, that being. But I want to talk about if you're ready to kind of move into this. Now, we talked about all these, what the Old Testament sacrifices, what they did. But what's really I, I get to, to the point now where who do they point to? And, and what did Christ and his work on the cross, how did that complete all that? Well, you know, that's the key. I think this is really the capstone because, you know, we talked about a lot of things that, that they received, but ultimately these sacrifices pointed to one act. Like the Day of Atonement was the thing that happened yearly. Right. Well, there would be one event that was going to happen one time for the for the whole world, for the benefit of the whole world not just the people of Israel. Right. Yeah, well... And, and he talked talk about, I think about Hebrews chapter 9 and 10 really yeah. lay that out. Yeah, I was just going to say Hebrews 9 verse 11. There, I'll let scripture kind of describe it for us. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant. Uh, so, I mean, this, this, it, it's, it just goes on. And, and Hebrews is a great book to read. And like you said, chapters nine and ten are a good place to go if you're looking for this uh, Christ once for all sacrifice that all the sacrifices of the Old Testament pointed to. Um, that that that's a great great way to approach it. I mean, it's just through God's word. Yeah, and, and I think it's important to really emphasize you know, what has shed blood, but also it was a one-time sacrifice. Yeah. You know, at the altar, we don't re-sacrifice Christ over and over again on Sunday. We simply receive the benefits of that one sacrifice as as the as that crucified body and blood of Christ is given in and under the bread and wine, received for the forgiveness of their sins, believing those words given and shed for you. It, it, but it was all based off a one sacrifice because our Catholic brothers and sisters, they have an understanding that they're re-sacrificing Christ some sense at the altar every Sunday. We yeah, reject I'm glad I don't idea. have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a, no. And that's something that, that's something that we, you know, we uh, have to openly reject because it's yeah. clear, clear from scripture. And I now read Hebrews 10, uh, 12 through 14. But when Christ had offered 
for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies would be made a footstool for a seat. By a single offering, he has perfected all time those who are being sanctified. Uh, and then, especially that language is now him seated at the right hand of the Father. Just as when Christ said it is finished at the cross, also by him seated at the right hand of the Father, it is finished. Yeah. What was done has been done. And, and one of the beautiful things, I love this verse 14, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Yeah. Now his work, his shed blood, his perfect life, uh, we now are sanctified by that. Just as he is holy, we are also made holy. Right. It yeah, and, better than that. And, and I and I love that the um the old testament. So so um another way to talk about this is that the in the old testament the believers were justified through the sacrifices that they made, but their doing of the sacrifices you could say was part of their life of sanctification. They were listening to God's word. That was um obeying his commands, if you will. Yeah. And, and and I and I love the analogy to our our worship life as well. We we hear God's word. We receive His sacraments. We are we are doing what God calls us to do, um, and, and at the same time receiving that justification through those means by which He provides them. And 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 it's um, it's one thing to to think about sanctification as our work, um, but it's when you understand that that's God's Spirit working in you. Um, it, it makes it even more beautiful to know that it's it's not even up to you to to choose to go to church to get what God wants to give right. you. It's uh, God gets all the glory. He gets all the credit. You're you're in that place. You're hearing that word because of him. He's he's preserved it for you. And he's he's given the the person proclaiming it, the lips to do it and and you the ears to hear it. That's all all God. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's part of being and, and because of that, we can be salt and light is what you preached on which we probably most of us preached on a couple weeks ago you know luther has a great comment there about being salt and light it's a result of something it's it's a result of believing and teaching mm -hmm. and because it's it's god's means of grace it's through his instruction through his means that we can be salt and light to be fully sanctified in, in what we in who we are called to be as we're created in the image of Christ, recreated in the image of Christ, by virtue of our holy baptism, being clothed in his righteousness. Uh, these are all things of, of that has its uh, that has its continued fruit that just not it's just not isolated to the sanctuary. Yeah. But again, as I mentioned earlier, it's carried out into our daily lives. Yeah, so. definitely. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. I um I I've I've been thinking kind of comically. I've been mentioned to a couple of people this was our topic for the week and uh I think somebody said, I think as uh, people I was referencing earlier, they uh, they said, uh, well, aren't you glad you don't have to do sacrifices anymore? <laughs> I'm so glad that I get to be a called and ordained servant of the word instead of yes. a called and ordained servant of blood. I mean, the the Levitical priests in the Old Testament, man, they they had a different uh, skill set to um, to bring to their office than than we are required or gifted with. So. You know, when you think about to it, it I know at uh, Fort Wayne on the uh, on Divine Service, which was the Holy Communion was offered on Wednesdays, they would fill the whole sanctuary with incense. And I never knew this until I went through seminary and I took some of my Old Testament classes that those in incense in the Old Testament was, yeah, it was it symbolized the prayers of God's people, but it also covered the the stench of of all the blood <laughs> that was being sacrificed. You know, so then when I once I realized learned that and you walk into a sanctuary that has incense boy now the the atonement really comes down or really comes in full view for you even mm -hmm. through your senses that uh blood was shed yes uh, and it's uh it's a uh it's a heavy topic but it's also a joyful one too it, yeah. it really is definitely and uh someday we'll be uh um with the lamb who was slain um uh, face to face yeah, yeah revelation uh, chapter 5 i believe it is talks about i beheld the lamb that was slain standing yeah yep. yeah 
I don't know. How, do you, any, anything else you want to touch on with this? I, I don't know if we um, – we definitely didn't cover the bases. I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to put something in the show notes, and if you're really uh, into digging deeper, maybe uh, um, whoever posed this question might want to check this out. There's a 20-hour-long YouTube uh, series. There's a playlist of 20 sessions that Dr. Kleinig, uh, who's a Lutheran uh, theologian uh, in, in Australia – he, uh, he he goes into depth and he's uh, if if not the foremost he's a expert on the uh the sacrificial system of the old testament he wrote the uh these blue commentaries that are being published by cph he wrote the leviticus and the hebrews one which are really um companion books both old and new testament because they talk so much about this topic here so i'll i'll, I'll, dr I'll drop a link to that a playlist for those if if anybody wants to just check it out to see um see one of the foremost uh Lutheran scholars of our day uh, talking about this topic. He 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 can do it justice. We we can just scratch the surface. Well, and for those of, of uh, like minds like myself, it's a simpleton like myself. There's a nice little yeah. thin book here. It's uh, I get it just right here. Yeah, there we go. A survey of covenant history uh, by Walter Roars. Uh, very simple, very to the point. Gives a very simple uh, overview of of the worship life sacrifices and uh what's it we didn't talk about too and he talks about the temple and the priest and the tabernacle or the tabernacle yeah. in, in a sense uh which really could have went off you know because it, it was within the tabernacle that all these sacrifices took place yeah and then we have that great language in john chapter one where the word became flesh and tabernacled with us again pointing us back to he was the place, the source, and, and he would be the event that would take place would be that one sacrifice. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that was mentioned in the Hebrews passage here. I, and another thing I always like to point out is the first verse of Leviticus and the first book, first verse of numbers um, really describe uh, what the book of Leviticus gives, what the sacrificial system gives. Um, and, and just to, to read those real quick here, uh, Leviticus 1 verse 1 says, um, The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, and then Numbers uh, 1 verse 1, notice it said, The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. Now Numbers 1 verse 1 says, uh, The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting. And so now Moses is in the tent, in the presence of the Lord. And that's what these sacrifices gave is access to God. And, and I, I love that, that little, you, you know, you're not going to connect those verses unless you read them uh, one after another and right. see that little difference in the pre preposition to show the location that, that the Lord was in respect to Moses or Moses was in respect to the Lord. And, and I, I love that beautiful, quick illustration of what these sacrifices provide and and all of those sacrifices, Old Testament, pointed to Christ, who now gives us that um, ability to be in the presence of the Lord. He makes us holy and, and gives us that that ability to stand before him. Yeah, I can't add anything to that. Well, you probably could, okay. but. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Well, we'll, we'll <laughs> let it go there. Um, we're. We um we're a little bit uh, aware that next week we're going to be off. Um, there's there's no school here, and I'm going to be uh spending most of the day with my my kids. I think um so uh maybe look for us February 27th if you watch these uh live or or when they're released I should say and um but the um topic to be determined. So if you got any good ones, so let us know. All righty, sounds good. All right. God bless you all. Thanks for being with us. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. So let us know. Yes. Blessings, everybody. Thank you.